This is Richard Heinberg from uh, California, uh, author of several best-selling books on peak oil, who's in New Zealand just for a few days, and uh, we have him with us in Wellington today. He's given a talk to um, people in the parliamentary complex and public lecture tonight. Richard, you heard the Minister of Finance say in the House today that there are many different experts on peak oil and they all have different predictions about when it's happening or whether it's already happened and he didn't seem to want to engage in that discussion. What is it that makes you so sure that peak oil is either just happened or is imminent? Yeah, well I was very disappointed to hear his response uh, because the, as far as I can see the evidence is overwhelming that, uh, that we're in the peaking period right now. Most oil producing countries are past their national oil production peaks um, and we've seen actual oil production stalled out for the past two years and actually declining by about 1%. Uh, the International Energy Agency now is saying that they don't see where new supply will come from to, to lift production from current levels after 2010. The figures you've been showing us seem to suggest that all liquid fuels peaked around July of last year. Right. Who can come up with evidence to the contrary of that? Well, ultimately, uh, we have to wait and see. I mean, it's, it's technically possible that we'll see higher oil production in uh, 2008 or 2009, but it gets harder with every passing year as we see uh, countries like uh, Mexico going into steep decline in oil production, as we see Russia, which has been the main driver of increased supply outside of OPEC for the past decade, as we see Russia now leveling off in oil production. And it gets especially challenging as we see that these oil exporting countries are having growing domestic demand for oil so that the amount available for export is shrinking much faster than the total global supply. The total global supply is only shrinking now by maybe a little over 1% per year, but the, uh, the amount available to the export market is shrinking much faster than that. We know that uh, almost all of the important exporters like Russia, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Mexico, and so on, are seeing very uh, rapid rises in internal demand for oil. So, this uh, can only bode uh, very ill for oil importing nations like the US, China, and New Zealand for that matter. If we leave it up to the market, prices will continue to rise and ultimately price whole nations out of the market for oil. Nations that need to use oil for transport, in some cases for generating electricity, for, for agriculture won't have any oil with which to maintain their economies. The only way to, uh, to prevent that from happening is for countries that use oil to deliberately restrict their consumption. And, and that's, that's uh, the intent of the oil depletion protocol about which uh, I and a number of other uh, people have, have written in recent years. Mm. And what's the web reference for that for people who want to look it up? Which oil depletion protocol dot org. That's easy. Yeah. The message has to be um, communicated uh, in two ways. First, uh, the, the hard facts have to be shared with the public that we've reached the end of cheap energy and that the global oil supply is shrinking. And that is disturbing news, but that has to be balanced with uh, messages that stress the opportunities, that stress the, uh, the benefits to individuals and families and to society as a whole from more public transportation, from redesigning our cities to be more walkable and bicyclable, uh, benefits from organic agriculture as opposed to fossil fuel based agriculture. If those benefits are stressed alongside the, the, the hard facts of restricted supply, then I think uh, we're more likely to see buy-in from the public. Well, as you know, the, the Green Party has been referring to the fact that this day would come for some 30 years now. I mean, I lived through the oil um, shocks of the 70s right. and that was a real warning that we failed to observe as a, as a nation, as a, as a world, really. Mm -hmm. One of the tankers that was destined for us in 79 turned around in mid-ocean and went somewhere else instead. Mm -hmm. um, we also are very, we're very dependent on, on imported oil. Uh, so after 1979, we turned around and exploited our own oil. Uh, we managed to peak 
our oil production <laughs> in New Zealand in the year that world prices were lowest. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was around about 1986 or so. Yeah. And um, we managed to peak our gas production from an enormous gas field in around 2000, and that's been declining very steeply. So now we're back to importing again. What do you see as the particular opportunities that New Zealand has had now? Yeah. Well, the advantage is that New Zealand has enormous resources of renewable electricity um, from hydropower uh, and potentially from more wind power and geothermal, which has already been developed to a certain degree, from uh, wave power, uh, uh, tidal power. And if, if all of these were developed, they could supplement one another. Ultimately, I think uh, New Zealand could be uh, energy independent, but the only way it's going to get there is if it reforms its transport system, uh, electrifies the transport system, and, and, uh, and builds more public transportation infrastructure. And if it, uh, it changes out its agricultural system to be less reliant on fossil fuels. So it's quite a coincidence really that you're here today, the same day that I've just launched the energy efficiency and conservation strategy. Well, happy coincidence, which, yes. Which uh, tries yeah. to do a lot of those things with fuel efficiency standards for vehicles and um, you know, more electric public transport and insulation of houses and so on. Mm -hmm. Beyond that, our exports are extremely dependent on oil tourism, with over overseas tourist arrivals predicted by the government to increase 4% a year from now on. Mm -hmm. And our farming, will the rich countries who currently buy our dairy products be able to afford to continue to buy 90% of our dairy products mm -hmm. when peak oil hits them? Unfortunately, I don't think so. And the, the sensible thing for New Zealand to do, and it, I know it's from a policy standpoint, this is going to be very difficult, but the sensible thing is uh, to create incentives for New Zealand's agriculture to become more diversified and to be producing food more for local consumption and less for export because uh, that export market is going to dry up. It's inevitable. Um, there will be less tourism. That 4% per year growth will never materialize. Uh, uh, tourism won't simply go away overnight air travel won't go away overnight, but, but clearly um, fuel costs are the second, currently the second biggest cost to the airlines after salaries. And with uh, oil prices now at $80 a barrel and almost inevitably set to go much higher than that, uh, the airline industry is almost inevitably going to contract. We've developed the, the, the belief that economic uh, well-being is all about growth and continual increase in per capita consumption. Uh, that can't continue. However, um, real human happiness and satisfaction doesn't really come from continual increase in per capita consumption. That, that's not an opinion. We've, there have been endless studies to that effect. Um, and so if we, if we want to prepare for a survivable and satisfying future, we need to focus on aspects of society, aspects of human psychology that aren't peaking and won't peak anytime soon. Things like community, intergenerational solidarity, the sense of, of good work well done, the sense of contributing to the society around us. These sorts of things have actually been um, ignored and, and downplayed in the rush to produce economic growth through cheap energy. And now we need to turn our attention back to the real fundamentals of what makes life worthwhile.